Father in heaven, we ask that you would allow us to proclaim, to comprehend, and to live out the truth in your word. Thank you that you have prepared us for times such as this. Thank you for the honesty of your word. Thank you for the way that your word, you allow it to draw us to yourself. Even now we thank you, we pray, Lord, that you would receive all, any and all glory or commendation that may come from this, uh, even now. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. All right, uh, I was watching TV two nights ago, uh, and a commercial came on, of all things, for Ford F-150 trucks. And the commercial made the statement, uh, and none of us most likely would disagree with this, the world has turned upside down. Uh, and in many ways, that question, uh, that realization has been coloring our thoughts, our thinking uh, for the last five weeks now. Uh, and we're wondering, what do we do during this time? That same question was asked by David himself uh, in Psalm 11, verse 3, that we're going to see uh, in our lesson today. The present pandemic, COVID-19, and Ann frequently has to correct my pronunciation of that, has jeopardized our health. It has changed all of our lifestyles. Uh, and for many of us has created uh, a certain amount of economic chaos. Over the course of approximately five weeks, millions in America have lost their jobs and have filed for unemployment benefits. On Friday, April 17th, the, the news reported that in Los Angeles County, less than half of the residents are unemployed. Change that, less than half of the residents are employed. Checking the uh, local newspapers uh, just last evening, in the Vancouver, Washington area, Unemployment claims before March 15th were reportedly uh, at something like five to 6,000 per week. If I read the reports correctly, during the three weeks following March 15, 2020, they averaged approximately 160,000 per week. Um, that would be for the state of Washington as a whole. Investment portfolios have dropped in value by 20 to 30 percent. Those of us who develop a certain amount of identity uh, based on the work that we perform, that we do, uh, are experiencing a certain amount of grief resulting from the lack of being able to perform that work. And in essence, we're wondering who we are in some cases. We're wondering what's going on. We're concerned about a little known and poorly understood medical virus, a virus that we have not yet developed a vaccine for that reportedly can cause the body's immune system to turn upon itself uh, and essentially destroy its own organs. The virus has reached an international level, and it has exposed government deficiencies both in America and in many other countries of the world. We're not sure at times whether it is the virus itself or a certain amount of government overreaction which causes the greater threat to us. We've been in uh, close contact with uh, a number of our missionaries. One missionary from Africa wrote to us about a week ago, from the beginning of the COVID-19 lockdown, townships are experiencing police brutality and senseless force. 
Uh, missionaries in India report that they are locked down for all but two hours a day, provided they have a permit. And if they are out past the time of that permit, or if they have gone a distance farther than local law enforcement thinks is necessary, they may well be severely beaten. With that kind of draconian uh, enforcement, uh, it may well be that we'll see the toppling of one or more national governments in the fairly near future. And if that wasn't enough, just this last week, the executive director of the United Nations World Food Program warned us that the COVID-19 virus outbreak could lead, in his words, to a famine of biblical proportions. Now, lest uh, we be unduly concerned, those of us in the United States, he was speaking specifically with regards to a number of third world countries. Nonetheless, uh, the gravity of his warning uh, should sober us and cause us to ask the question that David is raising in this psalm. Psalm 11 is the text for the day. It differs significantly in modern versions in the last and probably most specific verse. Uh, as a result, it is helpful to read it in both the New King James and the New American Standard Version. Reading it from the New King James, to the chief musician, a psalm of David, in the Lord I put my trust. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow on the string, that they may shoot secretly at the upright in heart. Now watch verse 3 raises the crucial question of the hour. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Then he moves on to begin to develop an answer to that question. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence his soul hates. Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire and brimstone, and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness, and his countenance beholds the upright. In the NASB, it reads as follows, In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string to shoot in darkness at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyelids behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous and the wicked. And the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Upon the wicked, he will rain snares, fire and brimstone. And burning wind will be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. The upright will behold his face. Now, the interesting thing about this, it actually starts, there's, there's a number of uh, fascinating aspects to this psalm. And the first thing that should be noted is that it was directed to the choir master, to the chief musician. The significance of that is that it was most likely intended to be sung by a choir, and it illustrates the importance of being prepared for times in life when chaos and disorder are rampant. And we've become uh, so comfortable in the Christian world over the last several years that we have moved away from that, uh, trying to think of uh, songs 
that might provide a similar purpose. I could only think of one. God leads his dear children along. Some through the water, some through the flood. All through the blood, some through great sorrows. But God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. Uh, and I was really uh, gratified, uh, Joey, to see the song, Your Refuge of My Weary Soul. I don't think I'd ever uh, come across that hymn before, but it does the same thing. It prepares individuals for times, uh, those who know Christ, those who are believers, for times when uh, circumstances are very difficult. So... Uh, this is a song this was intended to be sung uh, and it was intended to prepare the people of god for very difficult circumstances circumstances such as we're experiencing today charles spurgeon uh, comments that this may well have been written by david uh, at a time when he had to flee from saul uh, it is written at a time of very distressing upheaval for David in his life. If you can imagine, uh, he had been allowed to marry the daughter of Saul. Uh, he'd had the privilege of living in the royal uh, accommodations at the time. I don't know that we'd want to call it a palace. Uh, he was one of the chief uh, officers in Saul's army, and then all of a sudden, uh, God warns him that Saul is turning on him. His mentor, uh, the man that he had been promised he would replace by the prophet Samuel, all of a sudden is out to take his life. Now we know how it ended, so we contend to uh, minimize the frightening aspect of that when David was actually experiencing it. Now, the first thing that we need to see is that uh, David is counseled possibly by some friends. Uh, it may well be even his first inclination, his first counsel to himself, uh, to react in fear. Uh, in the previous two Psalms, Psalm 9 and 10, uh, the discussion is repeatedly on the topic of how the ungodly acting arrogantly, thinking God will not see them, uh, attempt to harm the godly. Uh, David knew that, he knew that all too well, and some of his counselors uh, would not hesitate to remind him, and they're actually calling upon him uh, to react in flight, to react in fear, and David says no. Probably the first thing that we need to remember, faith is the refusal to panic. Martin Lloyd-Jones points that out. We do not, we do not give in to fear. Uh, I would love if one of our national politicians would remember uh, the phrase that uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had uh, when he took office in the uh, early 1930s, and he said, the only thing we have left to fear is fear itself. The devastating impact of that fear is such, we see it uh, in the New Testament during the period shortly before uh, the glorious return of Christ at the end of the seven years of tribulation. The text tells us that men's hearts will fail them, will be failing them as a lack of fear. Uh, I am not a medical professional, but I believe we would probably, if we were able to tally uh, the number of emergency room visits, we would be surprised to see at this particular point in time in history how many of them, uh, ultimately when all is said and done, uh, are prompted by a fear that they might have, uh, the individual in question might have developed COVID-19 symptoms. So the fear alone is developing into a factor uh, that we really need to take pains to avoid and to disregard. And in verse 3, David 
asks the classic question, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Uh, in some of the versions, it reads, if the pillars are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Uh, Hebrew is an earthy language. Literally, the phrase used is the buttocks. Metaphorically, it's referring to the pillars or the bases of the earth. Uh, the bases, the things that hold together the social order. Asking the question, uh, it's much the same as that Ford F-150 commercial. The world has been turned upside down. Uh, the phrase is a metaphor for social upheaval. Society is in chaos, ruined, destroyed. Uh, we may not be completely there right now. Uh, we're still trying to figure out exactly what all is going on both medically, both uh, economically, uh, and also to some degree politically. We don't know what the world on the other side of developing some kind of a treatment uh, for this virus is going to look like. So yeah, we are in a position, we are in a condition where the foundations for many of us uh, the foundations for many of the countries in the world have been destroyed. The question then comes, what will, what can the righteous do? At the same time as we're asking that, we're also at times wondering, what is it that God can do, that God will do? Now, the answer that uh, the Holy Spirit gives us through David the first thing that we need to notice is that while the question focuses on what a group of men, a group of people will do during this time of social upheaval, the answer does not. The answer does not address human action. Uh, significantly, the answer focuses not on what men will do or can do, but what God can do and will do and which flow out of who God is. Now this is most definitely not to say that we do not take human action. The scripture tells us much of what David actually did at this particular time. I think my favorite uh, account is, I believe it is 1 Samuel 30, uh, David actually is dealing with the mutiny, of all things. Uh, we know repeatedly uh, he was fleeing from Saul. Saul would uh, back off for a short period of time uh, and then renew the hot pursuit. Uh, but for an unknown period of time, very likely in the plural of years, uh, David's life was constantly in jeopardy. And we know the action that he took repeatedly throughout that period of time. Daniel 11, verse 32, tells us that in response to the flattery of the Antichrist, and I love this phrase, the people who know their God will display strength and take action. They will take action. They will move. They will arise and they will take action as appropriate. But the point that we cannot escape is that we will take action most effectively when we act with a firm conviction as to who God is and as to what he is or will be doing. Take the time first to understand who God is, and then you'll be able to take the most intelligent action uh, possible in your own unique circumstances. The chapter ends with a promise of what God will do that is one of the most glorious promises, one of the most encouraging promises in all of Scripture. Now, let's take this one step at a time going back to verse 
four. The Lord is. Stop right there. The Lord is. Yahweh, the name God was known by in the Old Testament. I am. We see that again in the New Testament repeatedly. Don't ever let anyone tell you that Christ did not claim deity for himself. Repeatedly, he says before, well, in John chapter 8, repeatedly he says, I am, most significantly in John chapter 8, he says, before Abraham was, I am. Using that expression, he is claiming deity for himself. One of the passages that we love is the account of Christ walking across the Sea of Galilee, walking to his disciples. They're in a boat. The boat is being blown around by the winds of the sea. When they see what appears to them to be a ghost, to be some kind of a spirit or apparition, he calls to them in words we never want to lose sight of, take courage, I am. Stop being afraid. Never lose sight, no matter how bad circumstances occur, never lose sight or forget that particular statement. Take courage, I am. Stop being afraid. God is. God is what? The text gives us a number of features. First of all, he is holy, sinless, set apart, morally immaculate, the divine other. He is holy. He is sovereign. He is on his throne, we're told. That throne is a position of power. Acts chapter 5, the disciples are reeling from persecution. They gather for prayer in Acts chapter 5, and the title they use, Despotes, Sovereign Lord. They are reminding themselves, they are reminding themselves that nothing of what they are experiencing is outside of the control, outside of the purview uh, of the Almighty God. I love the first question of the Heidelberg Catechism. What is your only comfort in life? That my life is so under God's sovereign control that not a hair can fall from my head without God's sovereign permission. Not a hair will be lost from your head without God's sovereign consent. Now, why he allows that uh, in some of our cases more than others, I don't know. But uh, uh, we all have seen the reality of that uh, at work. What else do we hear about him? He is in heaven. This should remind us of Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. We lose sight of the fact when we uh, begin to read Isaiah chapter 6 that that also was written during a time of tremendous social upheaval. Uzziah had attempted to usurp the role of the high priest. He was stricken with leprosy. Josephus tells us that there was a huge earthquake splitting mountains uh, if you will, in and around Jerusalem. Uh, the book of Amos cites that earthquake and then makes reference uh, to the lion roaring. Uh, that reference may well be a poetic reference to the sound created by the huge energy. When Uzziah died, there was, of course, going to be a period of social upheaval uh, as he was succeeded in power. And it was at that particular time that God chose to make himself known uh, to the prophet Uzziah, to the prophet Isaiah, excuse me, uh, and confirm him in his prophetic role. 
He is in heaven. And yet at the same time, he has condescended to be here with us. The phrase uses the expression, he is in his temple. Solomon built the temple and in Second Chronicles chapter 16, uh, he acknowledges the graciousness of God in choosing to dwell with us uh, here in our lives. Never forget, never forget that one of the names the New Testament tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ will be known by is Emmanuel, God with us. No matter how terrible circumstances can become, we never lose sight of the fact that he is present uh, with us as we go through there. Now, that's not all. The text tells us, the text tells us that he is seeing. It uses two terms to describe the organs by which uh, he sees. Uh, and I'm going to focus on the second one that I'll mention uh, primarily. It says that his eyes see. Scripture tells us that the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the land that he may strongly support those whose hearts are totally his. But the unique thing about this uh, psalm, it says his eyelids test. His eyelids are examining. Oh, what's, what's behind that? What's, what's that all about? The first thing that uh, we should realize if you see the eyelids of the judge, if you're in court and you see the eyelids of the judge, uh, you may be wondering if he is still awake. Or if you have a, uh, a female judge, if she is still paying attention to what's going on. Is he really cognizant as to what we're going through? We're going through a time of terrible uh, challenge. Is he paying attention? When we think that, we want to preach to ourselves and we want to remind ourselves that there is nothing that the omniscient, omnipresent God does not know about. Those eyelids are testing. Those eyelids, when we think God is least attentive, he is examining us the most closely. He is most aware of what is going on around us at times when it seems like he is paying the least amount of attention. The other thing that we should see in that uh, analogy is the eyes of a marksman, the eyes of someone who is sighting down, in this case, the bow and arrow, uh, who is making sure that any retribution that is meted out will be appropriate. Yeah, the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike, but God makes sure that he directs his discipline and his punishment precisely. Now those eyes are testing. The phrase uses uh, the idea that both the righteous and the wicked are tested. Here we have to keep in mind that the same circumstances will have two different effects, two different results for two different groups of people. Those circumstances will lead to the approval of the godly. The New Testament uses the expression dokimatso, the testing, the approval uh, of those who pass inspection, those who respond in a way that glorifies God. Uh, in the circumstances in which they live. Those same circumstances will also lead to the just conviction and punishment of the wicked. This is a time in which we are seeing to some degree that occurring. Uh, I don't think anyone can argue against the proposition that men around the globe have been far too oriented towards the material, far too much 
convinced of the idea that he who dies with the most toys wins. Uh, if there is one thing that uh, I have realized personally during the time that we've been under lockdown, uh, how many more clothes I have than I actually need. Uh, it seems like I put on the same clothes when I go out to visit some essential businesses. Then when I get home, I wash them and I change. But I find myself wearing primarily the same thing, uh, the same items of clothing again and again and again. Well, that tells you something. It tells you that uh, uh, in many ways, even believers have been far too oriented towards the material. And so, yeah, we are being chastened, we are being tested, but the ungodly, uh, the ungodly will experience severe punishment. Some of them, uh, it may well be very serious, very severe uh, for the godly. God will go through it with us, and yet there may well be a punitive aspect uh, to this particular time. A man by the name of Thomas Vincent wrote a book titled God's Terrible Voice in the City. He wrote this, uh, and I believe it was 1667, approximately five years after uh, the Puritan pastors had been ejected. Uh, London, England turned its back on the true preaching of the gospel, and God allowed it to experience both a devastating fire followed by a, a devastating outbreak of the plague. Vincent points out that God's hand was at work at that time, and he was calling his people to a time of repentance. We would do well to remember the same thing uh, in our world today in which we live. But that's not all. The scripture tells us that the righteous are going to have a very unique experience. It says he loves the righteous. The Lord is righteous. The Lord loves righteousness. Jeremiah Burroughs, in his book titled The Evil of, Ev of Evils, excuse me, The Evil of Evils, uh, cites to Zephaniah 317, and he reminds us that God takes delight in beholding himself, in beholding his image, in beholding the impact of his character on his people, in those who trust in him and who reflect him. God loves righteousness. He loves that quality, and he loves to see that quality in his own. Know this, when you are reacting to a challenge in the days in which we live in a manner that glorifies God, God is aware of that, he is looking at that, and he is loving what he sees. Just a word about marriages. Uh, marriages are under severe challenge at this particular time. We don't have the distractions of uh, NBA basketball, college basketball, college NFL football, other than the draft just last week, nor do we have Major League Baseball. Dads are often required to stay at home. Moms are required to stay at home. Uh, they are faced with the reality of having, in many cases, uh, adopted a lifestyle far beyond uh, what they should be experiencing. Uh, they are required to realize the challenge that each other holds, the challenge that Genesis 3 tells us that God uh, has placed on the common grace of marriage. Why? With a goal, the goal of drawing men to himself through that sense of futility that it arouses. If we can demonstrate a godly marriage to those around us, 
that may well be what opens the door to be able to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ. That may well be what convicts those in your neighborhood of the sin in which they have been living. So make sure, take pains to, to focus upon having your marriage glorifying to God. The final answer to the question, what can or what will the righteous do during times of social upheaval? Uh, the, ver the Hebrew in verse 7 can be read in two ways. Uh, the New King James Version means or states that the righteous, again, who are these righteous people? The righteous are those who have believed God, who have repented from their sins and trusted in Jesus Christ as their Savior and as their Lord, and whose lives can confirm that claim. Those are the people who are righteous. They were righteous uh, under the Davidic time, and they are righteous at this particular time. The righteous, according to the Hebrew and the New King James Version, can be understood to mean that they will behold the face of I'm getting it mangled. <laughs> Let me step back. The New King James Version tells us that God will behold the faces of the righteous. Well, that's something that uh, we know elsewhere from Scripture. Psalm 33, verse 13, for example, no one or nothing escapes God's scrutiny. But probably the better reading, the reading that makes greater impact uh, and greater sense for this context is in the New American Standard, which tells us that the righteous will behold the face of God. The righteous men and women, those who their lives demonstrate the reality of true saving faith, will behold the face of God. What does that mean? Metaphorically, they will have an intimate understanding of God, who he is, his ways, the nature of how things are accomplished by that sovereign God. And as a result of that, they will have a much better, much more accurate, much more insightful understanding of what is going on around them. They will experience intimate fellowship with God in a very real sense. They will experience his blessing. And it is then and only then that they are ready to take action. So what do the righteous do? First of all, they take the time to draw near to God, to experience him, to know him intimately, to understand his ways, and through that, to understand the times and the action that needs to be taken. In closing, that intimate fellowship was illustrated hundreds of years later by the prophet Habakkuk. Uh, Habakkuk wrestles with the question of why is it that God is going to allow the ungodly Chaldeans uh, to wreak chastening, wreak punishment, upon the people of God. He knows uh, that there well may be a time of starvation caused by siege, followed by a time of violent death, possibly even his own. And yet we read him say, when he reflects on who God is and that intimate knowledge of God, chapter 3, verses 17 through 19, Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olives should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he has made my feet like hinds feet, and he makes me walk on high places.